new bill. And he had the megaphone, which he used at, to announce at the regattas. And he went around the shore of the various bays and telling us all in a loud voice that the Japanese had surrendered. And that was a wonderful day. Cora, you have some memories. Oh, definitely. Lakeview, in wartime, which is very nice. <coughs> I remember that there weren't too many boys around. Uh, Saturday night was skating night at the uh, arena, and uh, I would go with my cousins, my two Madeline and Doris, and we skated with each other. There were no boys to skate with, and it wasn't very pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, a little bit of it. Mention what you said to me about butter, because I didn't realize that. Oh, we, well, um, Neil was presenting me with a stand up. He has a, a list of the, um, the uh, what was it, the board? Uh, uh, people who the assisted ration, handing out ration board. Ration board. And I, I was just telling Sandy that if you went visiting for um, a couple of meals, you know, sometimes you go to Toronto and visit for a weekend or something, you took a half pound of butter or a pound of butter and your little bag of sugar, because if you didn't, you weren't very welcome. <laughs> and that was your contribution. <laughs> Connie, would you, would you explain how you got this t-shirt, this sweatshirt? Because there weren't men around? The, the last year I was in high school. The, the last year where, uh, I was in high school, uh, we were through school in May and we joined the armed services for, for school people. And, and uh, that summer I went up to, oh, there was about 10 or 12 from Lakefield and it joined it. And, and outside of uh, Toronto, the other side of Toronto, we went on a farm service. Uh, I, I forget, well, we were gone the whole summer and, and, and worked, in, worked in, in a farm. And I wasn't an outside girl at all. <laughs> Here I was. Working in, in, we had a, 13 weeks, but I'll remember the first day we were there in June 1 on the farm. They they sent us around to all these farms as, as they needed us. And the first day, we we cut, what, bent over cutting asparagus or something. Thought it was good. <laughs> die. <laughs> but anyway, we lasted 13 weeks. And that's how we passed our our, our summer. And I gained weight. <laughs> oh. But we had a wonderful time. Praise for a rainy day because they let us off. And we'd stand out on the highway and look for the first bus that came along, and they'd pick us up and take us into Toronto. You know. it, it was a wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you, Connie, and thanks for bringing us to share. Uh, one of the books that I brought from England uh, said the same thing about the women there, that they would head off to the farms to do all the, the manual work that was required at that time. Are there any people in the audience, any women in the audience, who went into a factory, a munitions factory, perhaps? I worked at the Havlin Aircraft uh, making a Spitfire during the war. Would you have ever run into a Jim Follett? He was a chief test pilot at different points during the war with the Mosquito. <laughs> um. No, not really. I, I worked uh, in the office in the, the spare sales where they shipped the parts to the different war zones. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he also was on bomber ferry for a while, too. That was, I was there at the Christmas that they had the big crash that the test pilot was lost <laughs> in the plane. Mm -hmm. 
Sally, perhaps you could induce your father to share a memory, and if not him, then maybe one of your uncles would <laughs> have a, a tale or two. Well, um, <laughs> I guess one of the things that I was always uh, amazed at was that uh, Dad went into the Air Force when he was 17 and to had the live on his age, so he could expand on that. Okay. Well, there was More than uh, 17 now. <laughs> yeah, I joined the Air Force when I was 17. I was the last of seven uh, brothers to go into the service, but they all went in the Army, so I went in the Air Force. I did uh, 18 trips on uh, bombing missions on Lancasters during the war, and uh, out of the group from Lakefield, an awful lot of boys from here went in the Army and Air Force, and there was eight that went into the Air Force uh, that flew in combat over Europe, and I'm the only one left living. And some of those ones, in case a lot of them forget them, uh, one boy was Mark Bullock. He was an air gunner on a land. He was shot down in March 45 at the age of 22, and he's buried in Brooklyn, Brookwood, England. Another one is Harding Stewart. He was born or shot down on October the 2nd, 42. He was 20 years old. He's buried at uh, Uden in Holland. Another one was Dominic White. He was age 21 and he was shot down in April of 43. Another boy from Lakeville was Jimmy Crow. He was shot down in June of 23, uh, 40, June the 23rd, 43, and he was 20 years old. He's buried in Holland. And Bernie Burroughs, he was shot down in March of 25th. 45, I think it was the day before Bob McCracken was shot down. And he's buried in Germany and he was 21. Now Art Kingdon, that died last year, Art was a prisoner of war. He was shot down in the Mediterranean in 42. So he was a prisoner for three years. And the next one was Bob McCracken, was shot down in March of 45, and then with myself. So that's what's happened with uh, the eight boys from Lakeville that I knew all flew in combat. My brother Alan here, he joined up in the Army in 1940, so he come to visit me at the squadron in England a few times. And Beverly, my brother here, he was all through Italy and uh, Germany during the war. He come to visit me and got me in trouble a few times. It's <laughs> <laughs> sweet. But that's what all I have to say. Uh, and uh, one day we we're on a mission bombing Hamburg, and uh, we got attacked by German jets, the first jet that flew in combat were an ME-262, and uh, <clears throat> I got credit for shooting down the first jet that was shot down by a Canadian. And that same day, Bob McCrack was on the, the prison march going through Hamburg, and he witnessed it all. He talked about it many times. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Graham, for coming so well prepared. Were you aware that there were jets, uh, or was this a total surprise to you that a jet came along? Total surprise, yeah. We'd never heard of them before, they'd never told us, and uh, we had uh, five attacks in nine minutes.
Now I've read that jets had <coughs> very, very limited fuel. Yeah. Um, so did the same jet come back to you or did No. No, they had that maybe nine or ten jets as attack. We had five hundred bombers on that raid that day, so they had lots of target practice. <laughs> but we had uh, Mustang fighter escort, and that's the first day that we had fighter escort of all our missions. And uh, they come back, and if it hadn't been for the fighters, they, they saved our lives. Perhaps we could have some army stories from Alan or Beverly. <laughs> or both. <laughs> Don't tell all yours. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I got any stories to tell. Not a lot of time in the slammer, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> there must have been a story for that. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't have time to tell them here, I don't know. You can tell a couple Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, something Tell them about the time that the Yanks got the pork chops. Oh, they didn't give me the pork chops. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tell them. Yeah. <laughs> well, Beverly, he used to come up in Scotland to visit me. And you know, there's times I was glad to see him go home. <laughs> <laughs> The forestry car. Of course, I could mention that Arnold was up there too on a visit out deer hunting. <laughs> they, they have dressed, uh, being both uh, officers, uh, sergeants, and art, they are, weren't allowed to come in our hut to sleep, but we just gave them our old clothes. And, <laughs> One story that my uncle told me, my mother's brother, who started off, he, he was a mining engineer, so he went into the engineers, but he got very tired of boarding and uh, transferred to the infantry in, in the Algonquin Regiment. And after the end of the war, there were a lot of villages uh, that had no power. And uh, because he was an engineer, he had noticed that there were warehouses full of diesel generators. Uh, so he organized a generator liberating crew, and they went and stole all the generators and took them to the villages that needed them. Excuse me, but before we leave the Graham boys, I think I'd like to know, there were seven of you in in uniform at the same time, and I'm sure that must have been a record. Did you ever, did anything ever come of that? Did you ever know that whether it was a record or not? Seven in one family, seven boys. So they all came back. And they all came back. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. I thought about their mother. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. A mother with seven boys in a war. It's unbelievable, really. Mr. Hike, you've uh, got some wonderful exhibits over here, and I wonder if you might uh, uh, point those out to us. And there might also be people here who knew uh, Mr. Harvey. Uh, I think you probably went to school with him. Well, I'm sure there are people here in the room who know much more about what's here than I do. Uh, I came across these medals Romaine Millwood and uh, Percy Payne quite accidentally in a sale and I bought a, a, a whole bunch of stuff and I framed them up as samples for the gallery and pardon me if I'm standing in any way but someone came to the gallery one day and I don't recall who it was it could have been Arnold I don't know Arnold, maybe it was you but they recognized Percy uh, because he had operated a, a men's 
Mm -hmm. the tree on, on, on the main street. On the main street. Yeah. I saw and that bill. I remember that thing. Is that right? Yes. And Romaine, I have her down here as Romaine Millway because I have all her papers at the back of the display. And she was Percy's wife. But she wasn't then. They were married they after were married, she, Yeah, and later. later. Well, this, that's why I have her here in, in her maiden name. But, uh, her home was around Port Holbert down that way. Was it? Uh -huh. yeah. She came up here. She was a very attractive lady. Yes, she was. And in her, uh, in, the, in the papers I have on the back, which came along with the purchase, it describes that she was actually uh, assigned to um, to New York, a New York office as part of the uh, oh, the, uh, the training program out of Ajax there, Camp X. Oh. And she was assigned as a secretary in the New York office of, of the Camp X organization there. Uh, Percy, I didn't know him. The, the stories I've heard, because I have veterans in the gallery and people from Lightfield all the time, he was a wild person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least uh, if I can believe some of the stories I heard. This is probably my favorite right here, because there's only one of, of this group that's still alive today. This is a photograph of the... Uh, the Curve Lake natives who served overseas. The badges represent the areas of service where they served. But the only survivor today is Merlin or Merlin Knott. Mm -hmm. And he looks like the youngest guy in here, right in the back row. Merlin was with the, uh, uh, he was with the RCR, this is his badge here. And he drives around all over Lakefield and the area in his pickup truck. He drives a little slower today because he's <laughs> aged like the rest of us. But right across the front of his pickup truck, he has a, a quite a large sign, World War II Vet. <laughs> so he always know when Merlin's going by. Some of these other people here, uh, Amos Irons, I'm sure people mm -hmm. in the room are, are familiar with Amos Irons. This is the uh, uh, Taylor, Mr. Taylor and his daughter, who served overseas. Um, this chap here on the end was, have to help me out. He, 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 he was a United Church minister. He, he just passed away a year or so ago. No, it no. was uh, who who operates the Kerr Lake uh, gallery there? We don't. Murray Murray No, he didn't pass away. I think it He didn't pass away. No, he's been married. Oh, I understood. No, I was at a service out there last week, and he he was the minister there. Really? Yep. He's surviving cancer. Yeah, and. Uh, 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 the service was for uh, Dalt Jacobs. He's a return man. Maybe he's in that picture too. I don't know. I, I did know Murray, but I, uh, I'm, I'm surprised and, yeah. and pleased that he hasn't mm -hmm. passed away because he was at uh, one of our church services. That, <coughs> excuse me. Well, our church partners with Kurt Lake, Wesley, and so. Now, this gentleman here, he, he, was, he was by the gallery all the time. He was always bringing veterans to the gallery to visit. Um, there, there's quite a story with, I call him Hugh because we, we talked many, many times, but Hugh Harvey uh, was a, a resident of Lakefield here. His father was a resident, and I understand his father taught at the Lakefield School. He was principal. 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 He was principal. Oh. Is that right? <laughs> and uh, Hughes, now it's either his grandfather or great grandfather, you told me, was Sir Charles Harvey. And I'm living in Harvey Township mm -hmm. in North Buckhorn, where uh, it was named after Hughes. I believe it was his 
great grandfather. But uh, Hugh served overseas, and I'll tell you why these medals are with me. Because uh, at one point, Hugh decided he would like to have his medals in my gallery, but he asked me to make up a duplicate set a little smaller and that he could leave to a family member, which was his nephew. But he left me this one with this very special medal in it here. <coughs> if you look at this medal, it says Lakefield at the top. Lakefield was one of the few communities that provided all the veterans with a welcome home medal. Mm -hmm. Now, there were several communities throughout uh, Canada that did this, but this, I hate to put it this way, is an extremely collectible item, it's very desired by collectors. I'm sort of proud to have it hanging in, in my gallery. Uh, I'm not even going to talk about the one on the end there because <laughs> <laughs> they pay to have it here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the Graham brothers, well, there's, that's the boys there. The badges are, represent the areas where they served. Arnold here and the RCAF. And I, I won't try and connect the names. The one that interests me mostly, Arnold, is the chap here who is Theodore Graham, who was with the London Fusiliers. And uh, Theodore, with the London Fusiliers, was uh, one of the early Canadians in service in Kiska, in the Kiska operation, which is the northern part of Canada and Alaska, where the Americans and the Canadians decided they were going to take the Aleutian Islands back. And uh, they got there, and there were no Japanese there. They had already left, but they, uh, they still decided to take the islands. So that uh, if there are any questions, hopefully I can answer them or redirect your question to somebody who can. I'd just like to say if anybody does have an opportunity to go to the gallery, it is an education in itself. Uh, I particularly like that big, thick book that you had. Was it? A, I thought it was well, like. Well, that's a, by the British Commonwealth Air Training Program, and it lists 16,000, a little over 16,000 Canadians who, were, who lost their lives in the RCAF, the Royal Canadian Air Force. Uh, one thing about I'd like to say about Canada, and Arnold will back me up on this, is that Canada had the British Commonwealth Air Training Program organized in, in Canada here, and we trained pilots from Britain, from New Zealand, from India, from Australia, <coughs> uh, from the Bahamas, and you'll see these different little flashes. I wish I had a collection of them, but I've never been able to put a complete collection together. But most all Allied pilots, including some Americans, a lot of Americans, were trained here in Canada under the British Air, British Commonwealth Air Training Program. Now this book that you're talking about, Sandy, was produced by the British Commonwealth Air Training Program. It's about that thick. There's 16,000 names in it, and it's all alphabetical, but it gives the name, rank, service number, the number of the plane they were flying, the mission they were on, names all the people on the aircraft, if it was a bomber crew, and it's a cross-reference. That one of the persons on the aircraft can be looked up in another part of the book. It's a magnificent thing. I also have a book, which goes back a little further, but it lists every Canadian uh, killed in action during the First World War. And it also provides their name, rank, and service number, and the date they were killed, and the identifies the cemetery where they were buried, which is an interesting book. <coughs> I'm a book person, military book person. My wife is the book person. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, if there, you have any further questions, I, I could talk all day. Some of the stories I've heard, experience from veterans, some of them are just incredible. And one thing I'm surprised you didn't mention this evening, Sandy, is that your father was awarded the Caterpillar, which is a very rare award to Canadian pilots. The Caterpillar.
Caterpillar Club is a distinguished club because these guys use their parachute to bail out. And uh, a lot of guys bailed out and the parachute didn't work. The guys that wore the parachute did work. We were very, very fortunate. I, I really enjoyed the story about your father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hyde. For the people here who were civilians uh, during the <coughs> war, I think it's important that we remember the tremendous effort that was made by Canadians who went from an almost non-existent Navy to the third biggest Navy in the world during those five years. And that wasn't done without sacrifice by civilians. And uh, we mustn't forget the people who kept the home fires burning. <laughs> Any more memories of those home fires and rationing? Yeah, I wanted to, uh, I was only a, uh, a youth, I was 10 years old when the war was over, so you, you can imagine, but I had very, very vivid memories of many things in the war. And the war was global, it affected everyone. Like, uh, uh, for example, I remember my mother's first cousin, Jim Crow, was killed. And that was a very sad day in our household and, and throughout Lakefield and Dummer. And, and then we lived uh, in the house uh, owned by Mark Bullock's parents. They had moved to Peterborough. We lived in that house and Mark was killed. And that was a very sad day. And uh, uh, when that happened, and across the road from where we lived was uh, Bill and Alice Morrison and their son Mark, uh, Jack. pardon me, their son Jack was killed. And that was a very, very sad thing. So there was so many things that happened that touched you so very much. And then we, I uh, remember uh, seeing uh, Bernard Tucky McFadden. He was standing on the steps of, uh, of Sid Hutt's pool room. And he, I guess he was on a leave before he left to go overseas. And uh, he was standing there in his army uniform. Uh, about seven weeks later, he was dead. He was sent over and he was killed very, uh, very quickly. Uh, I, I remember going to public school and you who were in the service must have had pretty grim weekends because we had uh, more saving stamps. They were, the smallest denomination was 25 cents. We didn't get much news on the weekend. We were pretty church-going people and was involved with uh, worship and quietness, but on Monday it broke out and uh, all the news of all the battles. Because the war didn't stop on the weekends. It wasn't a 40 hour week. And so Neil would rush in on Monday, very patriotic, and spend a quarter and buy a war savings stamp. <laughs> but about Thursday, Neil needed that quarter and he'd go and cash it back in. <laughs> so that's why your leaves on the weekend weren't as good as you thought they were. <laughs> <laughs> I also remember that uh, this was uh, the teacher and they were all very patriotic and tell us. I remember how happy we were and I don't know why we were happy but there was a feeling of exuberance all through the school on D-Day because the Second World War was one war that, that people at home really believed that we could lose. It was probably the closest war we've ever come to losing. And and then when D-Day came, we had to start to put Hitler on the run, definitely. And that was a happy day. And then when I, later when I learned how many boys had lost their lives and what sacrifices there were, I don't know why it came over in Canada as being such a victory and so happy, but it, it, that's the way it came to me as a student, as a uh, student in grade four. Uh, I remember uh, the rationing. And we thought we were hard done by. We had rationing. And uh, we weren't getting shot at. We weren't getting bombed, sleeping in our own bed every night. But we thought, and people thought it was really. And I see where the, the village of Lakefield handed out, and this was the fourth issue of rationing, 2,045 ration books. Well, there were only 1,735 people lived in Lakeville in the, in the 1940s. So they must have included the chickens and the dogs. You know, everybody had one or two dogs and a lot of chickens. And, but anyhow, uh, that, uh, and 
Korah, his name is in the write-up I have, was one of the people who handed out the rationing. Well, I had lived in a family that had, my dad was in the army. In fact, the whole village, uh, why we are such gentle people in my age group, we were raised by a group of ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Other than the First World War, the ancient people. And we were, that's why we were so, so, such little sweethearts. Yeah, we are feminine influence upon our, uh, our upbringing. Uh, <laughs> I was in a family of six, and we had rather. Well, I was the youngest. Well, we had a few gluttons. They take all the sugar, they take all the butter, they take this. So my mother, trying to get peace among us, us children, said, well, what we'll do, we take the butter, we can buy, and we divide it up, and everybody has their own saucer. So we <laughs> ran around, and we had our own saucer, and we'd hide it. Well, <laughs> then people defeated the purpose. I wouldn't eat my butter. I wanted to be, I was going to hoard it. Be worth a real good commodity at the end of the time. With me with butter, nobody in butter. Well, mother needed to do some bacon. She spied all this butter. Goodbye, or zero, goodbye, butter. Anyway. There were many, uh, many things. Then I remember uh, how happy we were. Uh, there weren't many cars around in the Second World War. There weren't many uh, young men around. Uh, and then I remember how happy we were, and V.E.A. Uh, did, V.E. did, May 7th, and I don't think we're near as happy as a lot of other people were, the, those who served. It was such a feeling of joy and celebration uh, in Lakefield and through Canada. And that was some memories that are very, very vivid with me. And I know the sacrifice, and I know the people who didn't come back, and uh, the people who had such some memories and gave up their so prime years of their life and nothing can measure to that what we put. But the war touched everybody. It touched everybody in Lakefield and in its own little way. So although it wasn't as tragic and traumatic as what many of us, the memories and the effect were still there. That didn't happen in the Korean War. There's no rationing in the Korean War. You go and buy cars, unlimited gasoline, you could do this. So different in other wars, but the Second World War was a, a probably uh, First World War was supposed to be the war that ended all wars. The Second World War was, a, was a, had an immense effect on each and every person in Canada. Thank you. Uh, Neil has stirred up a few other memories of local items. Um, I just thought of something that when Cora mentioned the Graham family and when you mentioned Winnie about thinking of their mother, I have in my possession a telegram that was sent to my mother and another one that was sent to my grandmother when my father uh, was shot down and they didn't know whether he survived. And every time I read that telegram, I absolutely burst into tears because I'm then putting myself in the place of being their mother, their loved one. And I'm thinking, if that was my child and we had to go through that nowadays, I don't know how anyone could get through that. And I'm wondering, did anyone here receive any telegrams about anyone that was missing or, or killed in the war? Do you, do you recall ever seeing any of those? Um, it, it must have just been heart-wrenching. There were lots of parents that just recovered from that, you know. Yes. They just never could rise above it. They just, that ended for them, thinking that that happened to their son and their daughter. Oh, I, I can just imagine that must have been how it was. And when I plead it at the beginning for people to bear your hearts, uh, it, it does mean a lot because I don't think my grandmother really bared her heart. And when she received that telegram that her son, my father, was missing and probably dead, it, it was, I think, so overwhelming to her, and a neighbor gave her um, an Easter lily, because it was near that time, just to say, well, I hope you're feeling 
you know, this is sort of just to know that we're thinking of you. And I never knew that. And as a little girl, I ever so proudly, ever Easter, would go over to my grandmother with and this little mangy looking Easter plant that I bought with all my pennies, and she'd pat me on the head and say, thank you, dear. And I never knew that as soon as I left the house, it went down into the basement, uh, <laughs> into the trash, because it just, all she could think of was that day and how she felt when she got that telegram and then the neighbor bringing over this flower to make her feel better. And uh, maybe in those days, I don't know if people bared their hearts as much or did you as women just keep it in and carry on or were, were you afraid to, to show your feelings in case then you weren't strong as a group or was it just not the thing to do? I mean, you had to be ever so brave for everyone else, too. Um, well, I do remember that Mrs. King did when art was shot down. She, well, she had a terrible time coping with it. And also Mrs. White, whose Dominic was the only boy in a family of girls, and he was gone, and it, it just killed her. Yeah. Neil has described the peaceful upbringing that many of us had. We might be interested to hear from Mr. Vandendort, who didn't have such an easy time. You really want to eat it? <laughs> well, the war it shaped and molded my, my character and my faith, I tell you. I was a fifth, an innocent, more or less, 15-year-old when uh, the bombing of Rotterdam took place, and that was in our village, just a few kilometers south of Rotterdam, was included in the bombing. And uh, I was, uh, we were all scared to death at the first time that we saw planes from nearby and the bombs coming down on us. And, there were 2,000 people killed altogether, Rotterdam, and you know, I think about seven in our uh, neighborhood. The one house was completely destroyed. We had broken windows and, uh, uh, other, and, and cracked walls. But uh, I had to recover fast because everybody was shouting to run out of the village to get out and into the countryside. And I was the only man around by the looks of it. My dad was, I don't know where he was at the time. We had one truck left from the milk plant, from our dairy plant. So I took the truck and uh, loaded it up with evacuees. First of all, our own family, my grandparents beside us. My wife's family was just around the corner and my wife and her two sisters and mother, uh, they too were on there, but I, uh, she was five and a half years younger. I didn't even look at her at that time. <laughs> and I drove them all in the countryside, and I came and back and forth, back and forth. Now, the Germans were flying overhead, and whenever they saw a truck, they started uh, shooting because pretty well all the uh, civilian vehicles too were taken over by the, by the Dutch army. And they couldn't differentiate from from the top from the, from the air which was which, so they were shooting at anything that was moving. So I had to make a run, and then often was in between the trees that they couldn't see you. And anyway, I successfully did some four or five trips. And on the last one back alone, I left all the people on the different farms. Came this fighter plane coming straight down. Um, I was on, riding on the dike, open dike, there were no trees there, and there I saw that plane come down. I must, that's when I prayed my first real prayer. God, help me, save me. And I put pulled on the handbrake, opened the doors, rolled out of the truck while it was still going down, down the dike. But in the meantime, he came zooming over me, and if he had 
pulled the trigger, he was still would have strayed and, and killed him if he never pulled the trigger. Why? My prayer was heard. I think that was the beginning of it. But I recovered rather fast because the next day, actually, uh, our uh, <coughs> uh, army surrendered. Our queen fled to England, and uh, the war was over. And the Germans were all over the place, and they took over all the Dutch uh, army vehicles. And uh, now they right away came with all kind of orders that we had to obey. And they had their own people uh, in charge, at one at one in every town at least, to run the show through the local uh, people. And people felt, well, we had lost the war, and it was the end of it, and Hitler was probably going to conquer the world. But not in our family, right from day one. And especially my, my dad, he was, uh, this is only the beginning of the war, he said, and we have not surrendered. At any rate, was, to us it was, there was no formal underground resistance movement for quite a while. But even then, the first few days, already it was quite clear to me, through my father mostly, that we had to do all we could to uh, continue the re resistance. And um, so I made up my mind. I, uh, I came across and I rounded up some of our trucks uh, as a 15-year-old as a on my bicycle going around and I, I found several of them, eventually found them all. But then I happened to spot this army uh, depot, Dutch army depot, with all the trucks and everything, and taken over by the Germans, and they were in the process of painting them all over and using them for their own, for their own war. And then I made up my mind that I had to do something about that. I, I knew I couldn't take on the whole German army and take on the, and take them up all those trucks away from them, but at least I made up my mind that I was going to get one of those, get one of those trucks. So uh, I didn't tell my parents. I knew I was not going to, I wouldn't have gotten any encouragement from anybody, <laughs> didn't tell anybody. But I, uh, I managed to steal a truck and uh, brought it home and painted it over and uh, used it for illegal purposes from, from then on. But you were talking about how mothers feel. Well, that was the beginning for my, my mother. So of course, she had gone through the bombardment and everything too, and then she saw me going all over the countryside, and she, knew, she kind of sensed maybe that I was up to something. But anyway, when I came back with that truck, my father was rather proud, but my mother, she was, she was horrified. She said, do you know, he said, that they are shooting boys for stealing bicycles and tires? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, mom, but the penalty was the same, so I thought they might as well make it worse. <laughs> and I said, and look, they were looking for boys climbing the back fences. They weren't looking for a boy go going out the front, the front gate with a truck, you know, so I got away with it. But it was, um, if they had caught me, they probably would have shot me on the spot because uh, that's, the, that's what they were doing in those days. So that was the first time. And I had some, later on I got involved after a while using the truck and mostly for getting food from the, from the farms for people in hiding. Firstly, first the Jews, but also other, other people that were rounded up there and escaped, and they were already in hiding, and I, you couldn't get, uh, everything was on coupons, you're talking here about coupons, but uh, we, our rations were a lot smaller, and pretty well everything you couldn't, after a while you couldn't buy anything, clothing, shoes, anything, it, and then all the food, of course, too. So uh, I was involved in getting the supplies for people in hiding, uh, through the underground, the resistance, and um, uh, and also the uh, distribution of uh, the underground the illegal uh, newspapers, and 
then um, other things that were going on. Sometimes we had other people in hiding in our house, not permanently, there were too many already in the house, but uh, just overnight and what have you. But uh, when I was 18, all the boys born in 1924 were called up as slave laborers. And uh, I made up my mind right from the beginning that I wasn't going to go. But I asked my dad, and by then we were very much aware that the, the war had was really had become, in our circles, the orthodox uh, small uh, churches in, throughout Rotterdam, uh, throughout all of uh, Holland, about 10% of the population. That's what became the, had become the heart of the resistance, the underground. And it was a holy war against uh, Nazism. It, you know, it was more than just uh, a war against uh, the uh, physical enemy, but it was the ideas of what Hitler stood for and what have you. And that was even preached in our, in our uh, churches, uh, especially in the smaller uh, churches in the countryside where you could trust everybody. But uh, in the city churches, uh, sometimes they, when people didn't know each other and sometimes traitors were in, slipped in and they reported back to the Gestapo. So one of my mother's uh, cousins was a pastor in a large church in the northern part of the country and he spoke out against the Nazism and he was one of the 10% of the ministers in our denomination that during those five years of war actually ended up in jails and concentration camps. And quite a few of them died, didn't come back. But he was, my mother's cousin was one of them that didn't come back. And specifically because he had mentioned Hitler from the pulpit as the Antichrist. And uh, uh, that was just enough for, to, for him to be condemned uh, to death. Not never officially, but he was seen that he didn't come back. Another cousin of my mother was uh, on our island. He lived not too far from us. He was involved in the first group of uh, five farmers who helped uh, some British uh, pilots uh, escape. That had come down, the bomber had come down. And uh, one pilot was caught, and anyway, they soon, the children soon found out where he had landed, and they rounded up the uh, farmers around the, the five of them who had helped them, and they were uh, executed on the spot. The first five that were actually executed for helping the British pilots, that was another cousin of my mother. And, but anyway, coming back to the time that I uh, was 18 and called up as a slave laborer and, and I wasn't made up my mind I wasn't going to go and I asked my dad just uh, to see what, what his opinion was and I, I can still see him standing there and he said son he said I'd rather have the son with his body six feet down in the ground and his soul in heaven than one working for the antichrist Adolf Hitler that's my opinion so I noticed <laughs> <laughs> that was for enough for me. I had, I knew I had the family behind me. So there were thirty boys from our village who uh, went working as slave laborers. If you didn't go, you could be executed on the spot or at least thrown into a concentration camp, slow death uh, mostly. I didn't go, and uh, the other thirty, uh, most of them came back eventually after the war. Some of them didn't. But uh, I was one of the few who didn't go, and for two years I was living as an outlaw and in hiding, still doing resistance work. I was going to do more, but I needed falsif falsified uh, uh, papers. So they, some, a resistance man from Rotterdam came with the camera and he took my picture and all the information and he went back and they were going to get me false papers so that they could travel around everywhere again and do some more underground work. 
But first thing that happened to him when he came back in Rotterdam, he was rounded up along with others by the Gestapo for some reason or another. I, forget, I don't know, but never found out the details. And they went to the Gestapo headquarters there and were all <coughs> lined up against the wall, their faces against the wall. And, and then one by one they were picked out and being uh, searched and interrogated. He was fortunately was one of the last, the last ones, and in the meantime he managed to swallow, to slip the, the papers. They were standing there with their hands on the back, but he managed, when they were not looking, to get into his pocket and put my um, picture and vital information in his mouth, and he chewed it all up before they actually got to uh, uh, was his turn. So anyway, but that was for me, it was, of course, it saved my life and his life, both. But uh, that was the end for me of being able to travel. And I was restricted to our island because the uh, one bridge and the uh, two ferries were under constant guard by the, by the Germans. And the rivers were being patrolled and that you could not get, uh, I, Without papers, you couldn't get off the island. So for two years, I was uh, as an outlaw living on the island. But I didn't. Uh, most people would go hiding in a hole in the ground or on a remote in a farm or, or somewhere. But I had other ideas. I said, well, you know what? I just pretend that uh, I tell everybody that uh, I didn't pass the medical test, and that was the reason. Which was true. I didn't. I didn't go there, so I didn't pass the test, <laughs> <laughs> and I got away with it. My uh, and, uh, but I didn't want to waste my time. And um, there wasn't. Uh, I had only a junior high school. When I was fifteen. I was. Uh, I finished grade ten already. Junior high school, and I, I didn't like school, so I, I went to work in our dairy plants and. But then uh, I had nothing else to do. I figured I might as well go back to school. And there was a small uh, high school on our island, 20 kilometers away. And I could get there through the country roads. I couldn't travel on, on the main uh, highways anymore because they were constantly patrolled by the Germans. But the out of back roads, in an hour's time, I could be at the school. So I went to the school and I... I knew that the principal was a member of the resistance, and he, um, I told him about it, and I, he said, well, it's fine, you just pretend you belong, and he said, I won't write you in officially, but you just uh, follow the, the courses, uh, and uh, he said, but uh, whenever the Gestapo or other uh, raiders come across the bridge out of Rotterdam, I get a secret telephone message. So he said, you just keep one eye on the blackboard and one eye on the door window, and whenever you see me come there with my thumb up, you run. <laughs> and, and this happened several times, especially after D-Day, uh, Normandy landing in Normandy, and we had so many things going on. So that's, uh, that way I finished. Uh, I finished high school, and the boys and girls in class, they never asked me any questions. In those days, you didn't talk about anything. You know, they never asked any questions. When I started quickly running away, they would just put my stuff uh, away and move over, and nobody ever asked any questions. Anyway, they never caught me. But then when the Allied forces uh, came closer by in the fall of 44, I, um, decided that uh, I wanted to join the army and it became more and more risky, risky for me to stay uh, on the island. More and more men, up, everybody between at the age of 16 and 40 was pretty well drafted by the, uh, the Germans for uh, either to go into in, work in Germany at the ammunition plants or locally uh, dig, uh, digging. Uh, obstacles, tank uh, uh, ditches and, and foxholes and, and everything. So I didn't want to have anything to do with that. 
So I escaped via the uh, partisans group in the marsh area that I first joined. And they were actually involved in taking German uh, uh, prisoners. The Germans, they couldn't all get to the bridges uh, when the British uh, 21st Army group and, and then later the Canadians then uh, came. The Canadians were in uh, Belgium and the Zealand Islands, basically, and the British Army, including Polish uh, division, they came and liberated the uh, territory just south of our river. I knew I was going to get trapped on the wrong side of the river, so I wanted to, to get out. And I joined then the, the partisans. They were taking those prisoners, the, the Germans that came across in rowboats that the fishermen lend them and told them, if you're on the other side, then you're home free. When they came there, we were there and took their weapons and, and uh, uh, put them in uh, rhine barges which were hidden in the, uh, in the swamps and uh, in the end they had some 70, 80 German, German prisoners that they ferried across when finally the Allied forces arrived there. So I, uh, I was with them uh, almost up to a week before the end but then two volunteers were asked to uh, row across and find to see if the Germans had left, and I was one of the two. We came there, we still ran into a German troop. Uh, the, were, uh, the German uh, company were having breakfast there. They didn't see us, fortunately, and we managed to escape. But then, uh, as soon as we came to the next village, <coughs> they, the Germans spotted us and they started. Uh, running behind us. Uh, we were on our bicycles, fortunately, and they were on foot, but we couldn't go too far because from the other end they were coming too, so we were trapped. And that's when uh, we came into the street with identical townhouses. You couldn't, and there was uh, a plaza there, and the first man we saw, we stopped, and he said, what's going on? He said, well, you're trapped. The, the British troops are coming from the one side and the Polish troops from the other side and you have a crack SS unit in between here and there are a few of them coming there already and they spotted us and if you were with the uh, coming out of the, of the marsh area where the partners were then obviously you were uh, you were treated as a, as a spy and you were shot on the spot so it was a matter of life and death and we didn't know anybody there, and we didn't know who we could trust and who we couldn't trust. But my first reaction was to, and to ask, he says, is there possibly a pastor living around here? We knew that most ministers, church pastors, they were uh, okay, and they were, and many of them were involved in hiding people and what have you. And he said, yeah, one, across the road from number 21, Reverend to visit. And we just flew, ran across there with our bicycles too on our hand. And before we could say anything, the door opened. And, they, and we ran right through the house and out the back door. The pastor and his daughter led us to a safe place. And his wife started mopping up the dirt. And from a distance, the Germans couldn't quite see which door we had disappeared in. And they started searching and questioning. And Mrs. De Visser, like uh, Rahab at Jericho in the Bible, she denied that she'd seen anybody, knew, didn't know anything about it, and the Germans, so finally they searched the houses, couldn't find anybody, and they, and they left. And then they told, and then a, a loudspeaker van came around that any male that would be seen on the street would be shot on sight, so we were trapped for five days. And, a lot of uh, shooting going on uh, from from two sides first uh, from the, by the British and the Polish troops and a lot of damage done on, but only a few people were killed because they uh, uh, they did uh, not bombard uh, the town which they did later on when they came into Germany if there was any resistance 
uh, they didn't use any bombers and only grenades. And if you were hidden in, the, if you were in the cellar, then you were relatively safe. So anyway, that's the way I escaped. Mr. Then, Vandendorf, thank you very, very much okay. for giving us such a contrast to what happened in this piece. And then I joined the, I joined the British Army and later on the British turned me over to the Canadian Army and then the Canadian Army turned me over eventually to the Dutch Army. Oh. I'm surprised that some of the younger men, and I guess the gals too, haven't mentioned cadet corps. Every school had one. They're all, all gone now, most of them, not all, but almost all gone now. But that was certainly a part of my growing up in, in three different schools. Cadet Corps. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember the Cadet Corps, Corps High School. Mm -hmm. I was uh, used to have an inspection every year, marching downtown. And, uh, mm -hmm. Neil, were you in the high school then? Or? Neil? Mm -hmm. Were you no. in the high school when we had the cadets? Well, oh yes, I, I was in the cadets, but not during the Second World War. No, we're too young. They heard about me coming in. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have very very memories too of the day the war ended, as Neil was mentioning. I remember. I'm pretty sure I was in grade twelve. Grade five, grade five, and uh, Miss Lucille Moore was our teacher, and she came in and announced to us that the war was over. And uh, there was a great celebration downtown, I'll never forget that. They let us out of school. I remember also tucking at Fadden. That's something that really stuck in my mind, the tragedy of war, because I remember talking too, up at the ball field at the school, <coughs> at that same time, he was on leave, I think, and then just shortly after he, he was killed. I remember that and I never, never forgot it. When you say there was a celebration downtown, what, what actually happened in the streets? Just a lot of people yelling. I can't remember the details. But I remember the downtown. siren going. <laughs> yeah, everybody was downtown. They didn't stop. Was just uh, <laughs> just uh, at your think of the families who had sons and daughters and brothers and sisters overseas, you know, and think that the war is over and they're going to come home. That's, I mean, for me, it didn't mean the same in a way. I didn't understand that thing, but uh, it was a pretty day. We got a day off school, too. Yeah. <laughs> and as small boys, we saw the end of rationing coming. There's going to be more sugar, more butter. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much for coming. Uh, many of us are enlightened by your experiences, and thank you for telling us them. And uh, I know that Sheila has got many, many notes, and some of this material will turn up again, I'm sure. And uh, perhaps, Sandy, you want to... Yes. Well, thank you, Michael, for moderating this evening. Um, I just want to mention a couple of things that, that were mentioned from this evening's conversations. Uh, Henry has all kinds of information that to still share, and I think he has a, a book that is uh, out, a, a print of his memoirs, and uh, it's very, very interesting. At the moment, this is the only thing that has uh, out yet. This part, so this, far. This, yeah. Yes, and there is a website that Henry gave me, and I, I looked at the website that tells about, uh, the, in more detail, the things that Henry was doing. And uh, then, as he was saying at the end, where he went after that, and then ended up living uh, in Lakefield to George Street, is it? The Dane Court? Yeah. Air, um, property, um, and so it was 1975 that he joined our wonderful community. 
And I also want to mention what Bill Hyde mentioned about Cam X. And I highly recommend for anyone who is not familiar with Cam X that it is well worth going to visit. I have gone there and it is at the, it's the Oshawa Museum, which is at the Oshawa Airport and they use the original Air Force hangar as the museum. Now, it is wonderful. It has all kinds of war memorabilia to do with the Army and the Navy and the Air Force. But the part that I'm now referring to, to do with Camp X, was a secret training area near Whitby, right on Lake Ontario. This was started for training people in the art of silent killing and they were put in behind enemy lines. This camp was started on the suggestion of <coughs> Churchill and he had been sending messages over to F.D. Roosevelt. <coughs> and in the meantime, Stevenson was hired to look into a place that was suitable. So they chose this area in Whitby because it resembled similar land structure and they could practice uh, parachuting down and all of the, the, the work that would be done on the ground. And it was so secret that uh, our Prime Minister was not up to snuff as to all that was going on. But it is an extremely interesting part of our Canadian history. And after the war, uh, quite a while after, the whole area was flattened and leveled. And the report that was done on the training at Camp X, only one report survived about it, and it was put in a vault. And the people that worked there were sworn to lifelong secrecy. Uh, now this man, by the name of Lynn Philip Hodgson, did years and years of research on Camp X. He lives in the area of Whitby. And I went on a trip to, the, um, to Oshawa to see the museum. And they set up a replica of Camp X at the museum. And this is a book that this Lynn Hodgins has written about Camp X. And he was there at the museum that day to take us through it. Uh, you're familiar with the James Bond stories that were written by Ian Fleming. Ian Fleming trained at Camp X. And Stevenson was known with the code name Intrepid. So there was a lot of amazing history that went on at this Camp X, and they are now going to take the part of the original grounds that's down by the waterfront, and uh, they have a memorial there already. But I would highly recommend that it, anyone that uh, is not that far to the Oshawa Museum, and you'd be very, very interested in it. Uh, there's a lot to do with the Air Force, and a lot uh, with the Army especially. So thank you for mentioning that again, Bill, and quite interesting knowing that that lady was part of that. Um, I, I met a gentleman uh, when I was in Australia uh, from this area whose father had been at Camp X, and he said he never knew what exactly it was that his father did. And in this property, they bought a farmhouse on farm property, and each men was to live in one of the, the rooms, but they were never allowed to see each other any time that they were there, because if they ever got behind enemy line and ever showed that fleeting second of recognition, well, they were both ruined then too. So there I go going on again. But um, there are tables of other information. Harry, you brought something to share for us to see on the table, too? Well, I, I just brought a, a, a regiment back from the 4800, and, and we were liberated by them. 
So I met one gentleman named Lakefield who, who was a member, Greg Harbury. Oh, uh, there may be more, but yes. Okay. Oh, well, that's good. Well, thank you. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. And I put some things on the back table. Um, I, there's even a spy magazine that I got at Camp X that came out after 9-11. This spy magazine has an article on Camp X. So we are going to have tea, and we're going to have coffee and cookies. And so please join us. Yes? Can I make one point saying to people who are interested in this sort of thing? I think this may, this may is when the new war museum in Ottawa is opening. So if you want a, uh, a day or two's um, drive to Ottawa and look around, it's supposed to be an incredible new uh, building to house with many of the uh, artifacts from the various wars and mm -hmm. It's oh, be beautiful. That would be well worth a the trip then for sure.